Welcome to Fitness for Consumption, part of the Think Fit, Be Fit podcast network. I'm Dr. Paul Juris, kinesiologist, research scientist, performance coach, author, and innovator. I'm here with my co-host, motor learning and clinical specialist, Gregory Gordon. Together, we have over 50 years of practical and scientific experience in things relating to fitness, performance, and health. Join us as we share our stories and experiences and take a deep dive into essential fitness concepts and some highly complex issues too. Don't worry, we promise to keep it practical. And you know what else we promise? We're not here to tell you what to think or what to do. There's enough of that going around. We're here to offer you a different perspective on fitness based on something called human movement science. Spend some time with us and you'll think more critically about what people are telling you. You'll sort through it all and understand it more completely and you'll become self-empowered to make better decisions for you or for those with whom you're working. Are you ready? Let's get started. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Fitness for Consumption. You know me by now. This is Paul Juris, and I am here with my friend and my co-host, Gregory Gordon. Gigi, how are you today? I am well. I'm very much looking forward to this episode. We've got friends and colleagues that are going to join us on a very interesting conversation about cueing and feedback. Yeah, so as everybody knows, this season is dedicated to the notion of skill. Um, and we've looked at skill from the definition of what skill is all the way to different topics of what things impact skill and how people struggle through skillful movements. And uh, as you said in the introduction, we have two really wonderful guests with us today to talk about their approach to skill. So let's begin with Dr. Nick Lee Parker. Nick is a world-class rowing coach with a PhD in kinesiology from Teachers College, Columbia University, where he's also a rowing and biobehavioral science researcher. So apparently the sport of rowing now has its own branch of research. After stints as an assistant coach at Yale and Columbia, Nick became the head coach of the Columbia Lightweight Rowing Team in 2014, just two years later. The team won its first ever national championship. It was also the first for the university since 1929. ESPN followed the team that year and produced a documentary called The Boathouse, chronicling this historic victory. They repeated the feat in 2018 while also securing the Ivy League championship. Those performances won Nick the U.S. Rowing Collegiate Lightweight Coach of the Year Award, U.S. Rowing Fans Choice Coach of the Year Award, and the University Coach of the Year Award from the Joy of Sculling Organization. Quite amazing. Now, let's switch gears a little. Gregory Udon Jr. has two, I repeat, two master's degrees from Teachers College one in motor learning and the other in applied statistics. Greg's currently a visiting research scholar at Brown University. Now, Greg comes from the world of dance. He graduated Hofstra University with a degree in dance and then toured domestically with the New York Baroque Dance Company, the Sokolow Theater, and Heidi Latsky Dance Company, where he's now a board member. Greg's also a co-chair of the National Organization for Arts and Health, a member of the Planning and Development Committee for the International Association for Dance Medicine and Science, and finally, a Westheimer Fellow and teaching artist through the Mark Morris Dance Group's Dance for Parkinson's Disease Program. Greg really embodies the confluence of art and science. Uh, Gregory Uden and Nick Lee Parker, gentlemen, welcome to Fitness for Consumption. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks, PJ. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, PJ. Excited to be here. Yeah, this is great. So, Gigi, what do you think? Yeah, so, PJ, if I had any artistic uh, capability whatsoever, I always had this idea for a cartoon of, like, 
two cavemen and one of them lifting a rock and the other caveman like, hey, like straighten your back or bend your, you know, like just giving, watching another human being move and giving them some, some sort of cue or feedback just seems to be the human condition. And, you know, qual- all biomechanics. <laughs> I love it. Well, qualified <laughs> or otherwise, it just, it just seems to be the human condition that we're obsessed with watching people move and then feeling that we know you know, there's something that they should be changing about the way they move. And so... I think wow. you were going to say, we know better. <laughs> well, <laughs> speaking for the collective co- the collective we that is on my social media feed, yeah, that that's what one could infer because, um, you know, my social media feed is littered with, from the most minute, you know, like moving an index finger three degrees to looking at someone do a squat, it's littered with videos of people moving and then someone critiquing the way they're moving and suge- mm-hmm. suggesting a better way. So cueing and feedback is um, not only in the sort of lay fitness world, you know, a really hot topic. In the motor learning world, the mo- the movement science world, it's, it's a hotly contested topic. So guys, it's a tradition for us when we have um, guests come on the show for them to give us sort of their origin story, as it were. So Nick, let me start with you. How did you get to where you are now? I got here by originally believing that I was going to be a musician Mm-hmm. And I went so to the university. We all. Exactly. We thought that. Well, I, I thought I was going to be an artist. So anyway, yeah, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> Those things aren't mutually exclusive. You, you can be a musician and an artist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I went to university in order to study music. And I was really lucky to study under a renowned professor who had thought about pedagogy, had really thought about how he was teaching his students And that was a really transformational experience. And as much as I loved music, I found that that wasn't maybe the career path for me. I finished my degree. I enjoyed playing. What I really enjoyed was learning how to practice, learning how to perform. And I thought that the quality of performance musicians could deliver over and over again was incredible. And I couldn't make that happen in my athletic world in my athletic endeavors, no matter where they were, I couldn't get that same kind of performance. And I had been on the rowing team at the Ohio State University. I <laughs> the loved Ohio it. State. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And I got into coaching to go to grad school and say, hey, I wonder if I can feel, figure out ways to take some of the things we've learned in music and how to practice and perform and develop that consistency. And can we apply these in the sports world and actually really improve our performance in sports. So I went through a master's degree at Purdue University and was coaching and had a lot of fun coaching guys and experimenting. And about 12 years ago, I came to Columbia University in New York City, um, where I've been coaching ever since. And I also completed my doctorate here, working with the teams to kind of expand upon that early stage knowledge. So I love the, uh, the music practice context and we can refer to that as we get into the conversation because we'll discuss something that we did in a previous episode and we actually use that as a reference so we'll bring that up again remind me to talk about that as we continue and greg um give us your story yeah i mean so i was also in the arts um i was you know set on being a professional dancer Um, and went to Hofstra for dance. Um, But I was also really interested in, you know, um, human movement, science, and biomechanics. So I got a minor in physical education theory um, when I was at Hofstra. Um, I was really planning on going to physical therapy school, and that was kind of my intent. Um, But I finished and had a performing career for about 13 years here in New York, um, touring domestically and internationally. Um, One of the companies that I spent the most amount of time with was Heidi Lasky Dance, which is a physically integrated dance company that uses both disabled and non-disabled dancers. Mm -hmm. Um, So that really, you know, kind of changed my view on what was capable of the human body. Um, And one of the things was that Heidi had created a solo for herself many years earlier. Um, and then she asked uh, this dancer, uh, Jerron Herman, uh, who has, um, 
unilateral spastic cerebral palsy, hemiplegia, where the left side of his body is very stiff and the right side is very fluid to learn this solo that she had created for herself. And then she asked me to interpret it in the way that he did it so that we could do it in unison together. Hmm. Um, and that's what kind of got me thinking about like, well, how is the brain processing this movement? And like, you know, he was balancing in ways that I was like, how do you balance like that? I can't uh -huh. balance like that. Um, and that led me, you know, into many different questions. And then I got introduced to actually Gigi, uh, who told me about the motor learning program at Columbia. Um, and that's kind of what took me on more of the science route of it um, and more of the, the learning, uh, the motor learning end of it. Um, and that's how I kind of combine dance and motor learning now. And I just do want to say we are taping on a day where Mr. Udon has just delivered his first lecture as a Brown uh, University um, lecturer. So it's an amazing uh, journey. So congratulations to you, Craig. Thank um, you. Yeah, you know, what I find really interesting about that story is, you know, trying to emulate a movement of someone who has some type of disability and their problem solving is very different from our own. Mm -hmm. And we think that we can just simply repeat what they're doing and we don't solve <laughs> the problem the way they do. Mm -hmm. So it's remarkable how creative people can be when their limitations uh, to their movement capabilities, we don't have those limitations. So maybe they're more skilled than we are in some respects. Yeah, and it was really an interesting process kind of going through it because my initial response was, well, his left side is very stiff, right? So like I tried to dance without moving my left side, but his left side actually has breath and movement to it, right? Like it reacts just in a very different way. So that's what took me the longest to like learn with him was this conversation about like, how are you doing it? How are you doing that? And just watching, right? Because I was like, oh, it's not just like stiff, right? It doesn't not move. It just moves in a very different way. So I had to like learn that process. Really interesting. And I also just want to put one final note on that is that I think it's really interesting. So my bachelor uh, degrees are in jazz performance and creative learning. Nick, obviously you come from a music background. PJ, our audience probably doesn't know, actually has a background in graphic design and hopefully we'll uh, scale it up more in the future. But any of the imagery you see for fitness for fitness for consumption is all PJ's work. And Greg, obviously you're coming from a dance background. So typically movement science is not considered a creative art. And it's really my hope that through this podcast and other podcasts that um, people will begin to see it as a creative art because typically we think creative arts are just painting, writing, acting, music. But, you know, I think the four of us and the guests we've had on and the larger tapestry of conversations we're trying to have with people that, you know, that's really what it is about using your creativity and applying it to movement science. So true. So Gigi, we have a special question that we ask all of our guests this season. That's right. So what might that be? All right, guys, let's, it's time. So we've asked everybody this season. So we're putting you on the spot here. So we've been having this debate over, uh, and this is kind of like taking it out from the bar room and onto the podcast. So what is the hardest thing to do in sports? And most importantly, why? So walk us through your thought process as to what that is and why. I mean, so thinking about it, like the, I, I don't think that there's necessarily like one thing that is mm -hmm. the hardest in Fair sports, enough. right? Like, I think that every sport um, or dance, right, or practice movement has, you know, some skill that we would all argue is like the hardest thing in that skill, right? But um, I think that one of the the hardest thing to do, right, is to like develop consistency, right, and like be able to repeat that performance under different conditions. So sure. in other words, the hardest thing to do is to be skilled. <laughs> if if it's very consistency true. is a measure of skill, right? Consistent goal acquisition. Yes, I would agree with that. Absolutely. So as, a, as sort of a general concept, yes, by all means. You guys didn't come up with one particular type of skill in a sport that you thought was harder to do than others? We didn't, you know, we talked about this for a while. And one of the things we kept coming back to 
is that when you get into any sport or activity and you start pushing into the upper echelons of what humans have achieved within that sport, it gets really detailed and really narrow. And the ability to do that is so complicated and it's so complicated in so many different ways. One of the things that I brought up immediately was gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And when I'm watching gymnastics, I'm seeing performers go through the motions. And the most impressive thing is when they stick a landing flawlessly. Mm -hmm. They are moving so fast. There's so much control. And they're launching themselves into air. So what they've already done a minute ago, or maybe five seconds ago, or even half a second ago, like everything is already set and happening and it has to be done perfectly. There's very little room to correct. And when that happens, it's so incredible. But I also think about some of the endurance athletes and you know, they're not facing the same kind of challenge, but they get halfway through a race and their body is sending them signals that, Hey, you're not going to make it. And they mm. keep <laughs> choosing to go. And so they have to do it over and over again, every step in like a marathon or I remember watching the end of the triathlon and the Olympics this past summer and just going, oh man, this is impressive that people kept pushing. And I think those mm -hmm. are the things like that consistency to elevate the performance. That is what's really the hardest thing to do in sports. And when you add a new benchmark, then it's even more impressive. Mm -hmm. So we've had, you know, we've looked at it from uh, different perspectives, you know, one of them being... Um, and our audience is learned by now Gentile's taxonomy and, you know, whether the body's in motion, whether there's object manipulation. I think there's a reasonable argument to make there that that is a harder skill um, than something where the body's stationary and there might not be object manipulation or there's no intertrial variability. And yeah, it's just an interesting conversation to have to look at how difficult some of these motor acts are from all these different perspectives and Nick to your point that like you may just be putting one foot in front of the other in the 29th mile of an ultra marathon in Arizona heat but how hard is that to do when your body is telling you like stop stop and you decide to keep you know persevering yeah it's interesting it's it what I'm hearing is a, a lot of information and, and people kind of weighing in um, on our social media channel with things that have to do with effort. So there are a lot of people who look through the lens of effort in that particular instance. It's not only effort, but it's perseverance in the face of overwhelming discomfort. So you could look at it that way. Um, you know, I tend to look at it from an open, closed skill perspective. So what is the relative certainty, uncertainty of the environment? What kind of prediction is required as you're performing, uh, when decision making becomes really critical to a task. So that's some of the stuff that I look at. But it's just great to hear people look at it through these different lenses and from these different perspectives because it really gives us more richness to this discussion. So I really appreciate that input. Yeah, PJ, I, I think of that like as well. And I'm, I hear everything that you're saying because this is all things that, you know, that I've thought about as well. And one of the things um, that I also think of is from like uh, Newell's constraints model, right? Uh -huh. Of like the, the task of the person in the environment is that we often don't think of the individual as that mental space, right? And that mental constraint that affects the, the motor output um, as well, right? And like um, to Nick's point with like gymnastics, right? Like thinking of like what just happened with Simone Biles, like at the Olympics, right? Like that all kind of comes into play in some form of coordination when we perform a skilled action. So Greg, are you talking about cognitive load and whether it's, you know, uh, psychological? I, I mean, I, there, I think that there are the psychological constraints of like how you're feeling, what you're bringing into that day, right? Like kind of what's going through your head um, and into that cognitive load on the mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you so know, I'm and... gonna, I, I appreciate that, and, and I think that's a great comment. And by the way, that is going to help us segue into the episode after this one. <laughs> um, 
but we have a special guest coming on to speak about just that. So that's right. if that's okay <laughs> with you, I'm going to shut the door on that because I want our listeners <laughs> to tune into the next episode. So um, with that said, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to actually get into the meat and potatoes of this episode. And we'll do that in one second. All right, we are back and we are ready to dive into this really interesting conversation with our guests, Greg Udan and Nick Lee Parker. Um, Gigi, where are we at here? So in our last episode, we broke down what whole practices, what park practices, what sequential practices, and how you might confuse it for park practice. So we basically, we went over different ways to practice. So let's say... Our faithful listeners have been doing what we have suggested, which is to play with it for themselves. So they've got a skill now, and they've decided upon a certain practice scheme. So now that we know whether we're going to try whole or part, how would we cue and give feedback for that for that specific skill? And before we even start the conversation with everyone, I want to pose a question to the roundtable here, which is, is cueing and feedback even necessary? Uh, I had an experience when I was in grad school many years ago that I took a class called the Motor Learning Lab. And Greg, I believe you actually became the professor of that I, class. Yeah, I did. The point of this class, however, was that you had to find a person and give them a novel skill. So you had to find some sort of skill that would be new to this person, and you could not give them any cueing or feedback over the course of the semester. So... My skill was spinning a Frisbee on one finger. So all I said to the subject was, okay, your goal is to spin this Frisbee on your finger for as long as you can without the Frisbee falling off. I gave them zero cueing, zero feedback, zero facial expression, zero body language. They came to my office once a week for 13 weeks, measured the results, and at the end, they got slightly better at doing the task than they were when they started. So on one hand, I could argue cueing and feedback isn't necessary. They acquired the skill to a better degree than when they started with zero cueing and feedback. So I pose it to the table. Is cueing and feedback necessary for motor skill acting? Well, maybe they just didn't need you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally willing uh, to buy that premise. <laughs> so there's uh, a good question. Is cueing and feedback necessary? And then we can get into... The, the rest of the conversation in the context of whole verse part. So, yeah, that's out so, on the table to discuss. Uh, this is Greg speaking. So I, my, you know, politician answer is that <laughs> it, it depends, uh-huh. right? <laughs> <laughs> like, it depends. We're like, I'm not going to take either side. But the thing is that I think that it's very task dependent, mm-hmm. right? Like if um, in that class, for example, right, you had to provide them with clear instructions as to what the action goal was. And then there's the implicit and explicit like things that they're getting from the task, right? Like, is it a task that's easy enough for them to be able to do without feedback? I work in dance where the movement itself is the action goal. The Mm -hmm. aesthetic appearance of the movement is the action goal. Mm -hmm. That is one slightly subjective. One choreographer may want something from another choreographer. And two, it's not something that I'm always going to be able to assess for myself. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm never going to become a professional dancer without somebody's cueing or feedback, but I might be able to learn how to spin a Frisbee on a finger without somebody telling me, you know, Mm -hmm. if I try it enough. Okay. Nick, what do you think? I do believe it's necessary in pretty much all situations. And I, but I think you can, the skilled athlete who's mindful of these, these little cues that you get just by performing an activity, they might be able to get by with less feedback or cueing from an external uh, person in order to get there. And so I think back in my sport of rowing to the original ferryman that kind of really got the sport started, there were a few of these athletes around the turn of the century did not have the physical size that we would classify as a very fast rower. One famous one was Ned Hanlon from Toronto, who there's an island named after him. And he was short, five foot eight, five foot nine, 
But Are you calling me was, short? Hey, <laughs> yeah. a rower, I, a rower short. I resemble that comment as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> but he very Go much on. found a way to be competitive with a number of rowers who were bigger. And in the sport of rowing, length and size really has a big impact. And so there's still a discussion about that the impact that Ned had with how he learned how to row and how it influenced rowing as it became more competitive. And he didn't have a coach. He was figuring it out because he had to. I mean, he rowed across the harbor to get to and from school. This is a guy who spent a lot of time on the water. And so there's a lot of feedback that just happened. But without that setup, I don't think modern rowers would get to a place where they could do the things that they are doing performance-wise without feedback, without cueing, and without a structure that's giving him this knowledge. So I think a big part of it is what, what are the outcome goals we're looking for and how do we get there and feedback and cueing is necessary to really hit those new highs in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think too, it also depends on how complex the task is because more complex tasks will need more you know, cueing and feedback. Yeah, I think there's a there are a couple of ways that I like to look at this. And one is, where is someone in stages of learning? So are they in the cognitive stage or the associative stage? We've talked about that in some episodes in the past. Uh, just as a quick review, in the cognitive stage, people are just trying to figure out what it is they're supposed to do. And I think that's a great time to provide some basic feedback and cueing because this helps them to understand what the task is. When you get into associative, now they're trying to solve the problem in different ways. So this is where their creativity comes in. For me, I try to pull back a little bit then and allow them to become a bit self-actualized. Let them figure it out a little bit on their own before I start giving them hints on how to do it. And I also, in working with personal trainers, I try to get them to just tell their clients what to do, not how to do it yet. Try to give the client an opportunity to figure out how it gets done. When you're in the automatic stage, well, that's a whole different issue. But, you know, I just also want to bring up, there was a video that I saw once, and it's a video of a dog. And it's a boxer. And the boxer's running on the beach, and it's running and jumping and cutting and spinning and turning and chasing a stick and doing all the things that dogs do until you look at it and see that, this particular boxer only had two front legs, no back legs. So who cued that particular <laughs> boxer on how to move like that? And I think if a dog can take his or her own affordances and turn them into skillful movement, then why can't people do that too? Yeah, that makes me think of something, PJ. The movement science program at Columbia has the Anne Gentile Memorial where they bring in researchers. So Greg, I don't know if you remember this lecture from a couple years ago, but Dr. Diane Damiano from the NIH came and she works with gait with cerebral palsy subjects, typically kids. And she was talking about the evolution of these sort of robotic devices that help cerebral palsy children walk. And she was talking about the evolution that the first suits were actually too stiff and robotic to where the suit corrected the errors for the kids. And so that deprived them of the error detection. And so what she was saying was skill acquisition is largely about error detection, that making errors in the, in the trial of actually trying to acquire skill is, is significantly important. So when we're looking at cueing and feedback, yeah, the risk could be that if you're giving too much cueing and feedback, that you might deprive someone of making an error, which could actually help them in the long run acquire the skill. So if if you guys could walk us through your worlds, which are vastly different in terms of what you do. So Nick, if you've got a team of rowers, um, first of all, forgive my ignorance for the technical skill of rowing, but if I was going to cue a lunge, like there's certain parts of the lunge that are going to probably need more cueing than others. So in, in terms of a row stroke, I'm assuming you don't give the same amount of cueing for each phase of the row stroke, and even person to person, you don't necessarily give the same cueing and feedback. So could you walk us through your world and describe how you sort of measure the cueing and feedback you give for the specific skill and um, scale it for that person. Yeah, and before you do that, just let me put a little more context on that. So in our last episode, we were actually talking about 
breaking skills down into subroutines. So this was part of our whole versus part learning and practice discussion. So we discuss when you take a skill and Gigi mentioned a lunge, we could break that down into discrete subroutines that we can observe independently of one another. So maybe from that point of view, or if you do it differently, maybe you can you know, address that question for us. Yeah, so when we are working with the team, we have what we call, it's labeled the technical model. And it's a description of how we are rowing. That label isn't super accurate because it's really just a starting place. It's a place uh, that is built about skills, the skills that the rowers will need to basically take a rowing stroke and then say, okay, this is a reliable stroke that I can perform over time under great duress, but then I can take little elements of that and I can adapt it so that I blend with the other people with whom I'm rowing. And that's really a big part of the skill. So when we are setting up our practice, we, we talk about these elements and we run through practices where we're focusing just on one specific element. And we're trying to do two things set them up in a way so that the drills or the, the, the specific practice elements we're looking at provide the rower with feedback just by performing the skill. So we do specific things with the blade on the water. We have the blade skimming the water, the blade off the water. We move things around so that just by performing the skill, they get a lot of feedback in the system. Like we don't have to say anything as coaches. And then as coaches, we're only providing cues when we see something that's maybe really kind of pushing the boundary of, of what would be acceptable. So once we start working that on a very specific segment, so we're looking at a specific part of the drive sequence or how we're taking the blade out of the water, how we're putting the blade in the water, we'll just focus there. And after three or four weeks of those uh, practices, then we start to build into a little bit more of a sequence where we're taking, I think you guys, someone referenced serial practice earlier. Um, mm -hmm. We're okay. Now we're looking at how we take the blade out of the water. And then two minutes later, we're looking at how we get up to the catch to put the blade in the water. And then we're looking at how we put the blade in the water. So we really sequence this out over the course of a few months in order to do the skill development. And this is something, right? The rowing stroke, we're just trying to repeat the same thing over and over. But, you know, one of the things Greg and I um, have discussed often is this idea of repetition without repetition, which is from Bernstein. Even though we're doing the same thing over and over, they never actually get it. So there's always some kind of feedback loop that's happening. And we're trying to use the cueing to guide this pull and part practice and practice variability to let them feel how different changes affect their movement. And Nick, when you've got a team, what's the bandwidth of error of letting the individuals sort of figure out their own stroke? That is a great question. Um, because the bandwidth really changes throughout the year, and it also changes from person to person in different settings. So one of the challenges that we face in our sport is you can adjust the rower or you can adjust the boat. And usually you end up having to do somewhere in the middle, especially for rowers who are 5'8", of whom we've had a few in our national championship boats, racing in boats with guys who are 6'5", right? who are on the very high end of what they could be for our team. And yeah, so they are making... Exactly. And so when I'm watching them, it's really about what's important is what's happening on the blade when they're creating this propulsive force and how they're moving on when the boat blade is out of the water to not disturb that transfer of energy and how the boat's flowing. So a five foot eight guy will have a very different stroke than a six foot five guy. And our goal is to try to create skills that will let them adapt into all of those things, but it does look different and it is purposefully different. And so that is one of the hard things when you're watching it, you can see crews where everybody is moving perfectly together, but it's not going very fast. And in other times, yeah, well, I would imagine, were, yeah, yeah. So if you have them of different heights and different leg lengths, if they're hitting the end point in the seat at the same time, that means the joint velocities in the larger person are much greater. So you're going to experience potentially different fatigue points with those rowers, I would imagine. Yeah, it might mean that you even train them differently. You give them more lifting, less lifting. 
when you set up the boat, you adapt it and they have to learn how to modulate their force so that it works with the overall crew. And there's going to be a lot of error, you know, that I would put in parentheses because it's not actually error. It just, it's a way of matching the other people in the crew. So you're talking about, you know, we've been talking about queuing perhaps from the movement perspective, right? Turning the blade, having it move fluidly. But now what you're saying is that people sort of have to self-regulate their force output. Now, how do you cue that? <laughs> um, you, you don't. This is one of the things that the rowers have to learn. And this goes back to a little bit of what you said earlier, PJ, about, you know, in that associative stage, letting people learn how to do things and not getting over involved. It is setting the practice up so that they learn how do I modulate my output so that I can achieve the outcome goal, get my bow ball out in front, win this race without collapsing five strokes before the finish line. And you have to let them experience that as a learn by doing approach. Hello all, GG here. We hope that you're enjoying today's podcast and want to remind you that more great fitness content is right at your fingertips. So please join our friend Jennifer Schwartz on the Think Fit, Be Fit podcast show where she offers her experience and knowledge about exercise physiology and athletic training in truly unique discussions on building resilience and inspiring high quality exercise. And now let's get back to our conversation. Greg, so you're really at the other end of the spectrum. So if you're working with developmentally disabled dancers, how do you go about cueing and feedback? And what's your bandwidth of error for any given um, person that you're dancing with? Because there's still an outcome goal that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, there, there is still an outcome goal, right? And there's still a, a skill being learned or a series of, of skills put together in dance um, being learned. Uh, one of the things, though, that that I really try to do is to increase the amount of problem solving for the learner. Um, so it is ways of structuring the task or structuring the practice in a way that kind of allows for the problem solving so that it allows the dancer to kind of figure things out for themselves. Because one of the things that happens a lot in dance and like Pilates, right, and a lot of these somatic practices are that we as teachers often get very caught up in like cueing every part of the body. And then it hits um, in motor learning, like the guidance hypothesis, where like we are getting them to perform a skill so perfectly because we're cueing them through it the entire time, but not actually allowing them to learn it because we're not allowing for error. So I always try to think about ways of allowing for error, right? Because error is more beneficial and also ways to strip back that cueing. It's not that I, I might never need to cue it, but like stripping back the cueing to actually allow for this problem solving to kind of flourish because, you know, I was talking at the, the beginning about my duet with Jerron Herman, the dancer with cerebral palsy, right? And the way that he balanced or the way that he problem solved was not the way that I wanted to problem solve, but we were able to kind of like figure it out, you know, together. But still, because I, I could imagine on, you know, different levels that um, you might be a little hesitant to give someone that, you know, has developmental disabilities, you know, specific feedback. But, but again, still, there is an outcome goal that you're trying to achieve. So even within that set, you can find ways of like saying, hey, are yeah. there still... No, I mean, we give feedback all the time. You know, the one thing that I think is is necessary with a lot of these, you know, um, if, if you're thinking more of like a dance for health perspective of working with dancers uh, with disabilities, is that safety is important, right? Like, I want to set up a skill and a practice in a way that I can allow for them to make errors safely. If the skill that I am asking them to do is not safe, then it is my job as a dance teacher to modify mm -hmm. that in whatever way is possible. One of the things that we often do in dance for Parkinson's classes is that we start out seated, which kind of takes away that like balance component, right? And it allows for, for more uh, movement capabilities um, elsewhere. So you know, setting the skills up in ways that allows them to still explore the skill, 
within constraints of, you know, safety or whatever it is that we're um, working on at the time. You know, it, saying that from the dance context is one thing, but I want to just make sure our listeners are hearing this because, uh, especially, and I've seen this over and over, sometimes trainers in their zeal to uh, um, develop exercises that are more creative and quote unquote functional, some of the things they have their clients doing are head scratchers to me. So it's safety in a dance context is one thing, but let's also apply that common sense to what we do in the gym, because if what we're asking people to do is not intrinsically safe, then it doesn't matter if they're solving that problem, they're still putting themselves at risk. There's, there's one other thought that came to my mind while you were speaking, and, and we had discussed this when we spoke before the podcast. I mentioned there's a, a researcher named Larry Abraham, and he was from the University of Texas, and he was looking at ballet dancers, and he was looking at movement variability. Now, this is really interesting to me because, as you said at the outset, the goal of dance is the aesthetic, right? So we're not using dance to achieve a purpose unless you're Gene Kelly and you're trying to win over the girl, right? So then dance becomes a tool for as a social medium. Yeah, so the goal is the movement. And therefore, when we're being judged on that, if we were being judged on that, other than the audience clapping... Adhering to that form precisely is part of the goal, which suggests that there's little variability tolerated because you have to match the form. But now let me go to Larry Abraham, who discovered in ballet dancers that the more skillful they became, the more variable they became. So can you talk to that a little bit? Because there's sort of a dichotomy occurring here. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is uh, an important point and an important dichotomy, right? And it it's not just in ballet dancers. Elite athletes are more variable than beginner athletes, right? But the important distinction is that they're more variable to achieve the action mm -hmm. goal, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. they're more variable in the smaller bandwidth, if you will. And the thing is, professional dancers, whether it's ballet or whether it's break dance or, you know, um, hip hop or whatever form you're talking about, they are often performing these dances on various stages, rake stages, outdoors. So you're constantly having to adapt to all of these different conditions, but you want the dance or the movement outcome to look fairly similar, right? Like you don't want the, the floor or whatever it is to affect you. So they're taking in all of that feedback in order to achieve that consistent performance. Similar thing happens in rowing. I think a good example at this year's Olympics was that the conditions were really rough. And some of the elite rowers who were newer to the sport and had been performing really well, winning World Cup and winning World Championship medals, didn't even make the final in the Olympics. And you could see that they really struggled with the conditions and some of the rowers who'd been had more experience, even if they might have not won on a flat water day, they put themselves in a position to be there. And so there's some adaptability that comes with that, a variability that allows people to thrive. Yeah, those are brilliant points. And, you know, I don't hear this term much anymore, but I remember about 10 years ago in the fitness circles, there used to be this term called an engram. And an engram was like this idea that people had that when you practice the skill 10,000 times that you have this like lead pipe locked like very specific way of doing it and that you do it this way 1,000% of the time and it's actually the quite opposite that if you look at a Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods and we had a full body EMG on them you would see that like each time they're so adaptable like if they bang their big toe last night really hard they find a subtle different ways to use muscle synergies to still create the outcome. So this idea of an engram, I'm not, I don't see it much. PJ, do you see that much anymore? But well, I I've heard we the term thrown rest. around yeah. or, you know, motor program is also thrown around quite a bit. And as you said, Gigi, it's the opposite of that. We don't have this hard baked efferent, you know, activation pattern that we turn on. In fact, what we learn to do is just get rid of the noise. I mean, it really skill is coming down to what do we eliminate, not what do we include. So it's our ability to 
turn off the things that we don't want to occur much more so than turning on the things that we want to occur because you basically turn everything on and then you shut the gates along the way and what you end up with is the outcome which is really a very flexible process for us to solve movement problems so these engrams to me it's just inhibiting effectively but i remember you used to use this analogy of an oil painting versus sculpture which i think would be uh good for you to explain here sure so you know when i talk to trainers about with this notion of a motor program what i'd say the traditional approach is we look at uh motor programs like paintings where we add an element and add another element and add another element and then finally we get this form and then it's set and we have this set form and that's what we continue to apply i look at a motor program more as a sculpture where you have this big block and you just chisel away the stuff that you don't want and what you end up with is the final form and that's sort of you know carlo de luca and the onion skin model and a lot of these other models are based not so much on what we activate, but what we inhibit. So we activate everything, we get a basic motor program or basic motor plan going, a reaching strategy, and then we just chisel away. We inhibit the things that are unnecessary and what's left is an effective movement. Nick, I think you wanted to chime in there. That is what we try to do in coaching rowing. We take it away, but I think the really important part to tie back into what we're doing is cues, Feedback systems, setting up your practice variability so you're getting all those things are all designed to strip away extra elements that are unnecessary and taxing, especially in an endurance sport like rowing. It may be a little different though in dance, Greg. I wanted to know your opinion. No, I think it's, you know, it's similar in a way because in dance you want to have very efficient movement. So you often want to have a good biomechanical way of getting there so that it's smooth and also has the benefit of looking good. But um, it's oftentimes paring down like the the extra force, right? Where you're like, oh, you don't need that extra force. Can you do it like this? Or can you can you do it that so that you can really see the choreography as clearly as possible? I'm really glad you mentioned that because when we define skill at the outset of this season, we talk about consistently achieving one's goals with an economy of effort. And I think we sometimes lose sight of that portion of the definition of skill. Movement economy is a really important part of skill, especially in sports and dance, right? If, if you're uneconomical, if you're using more than is necessary, and Nick, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, think about a basketball player who's overexerting themselves over the course of a game. By the time the fourth quarter rolls around, they're going to be on the bench, Right. If you've got a rower in the boat and they're they're expending too much energy, they're not going to make it, you know, and then the whole boat suffers. And so part of what we need to do, I think, in queuing, in coaching and skill development is to try to get people to move more smoothly and economically and stop queuing them to turn on muscles that are not necessary for the task that they're trying to solve. This is really the next stage for. I think all kind of motor activities to really develop because especially in sports, the way around what you're describing has just been to train more and get mm -hmm. more fit, do more mileage, do more volume so that you don't get so tired that you break down. But we're approaching a level in a lot of sports where people cannot train any more than they are. And so we have to go back and really bring the skill up to match the training that they've already put in. So guys, this is, you know, fascinating conversation. And I think what it's doing is it's sort of circling around this notion of internal versus external cueing, uh, because that has a lot to do with movement efficiency and skill. It's a topic that we really want to get into with you. And we're going to do that right after this short break. Okay, we're back. And, you know, this has been a great conversation. Gentlemen, thank you so much. And we want to talk a little bit about this notion of internal and external cueing. This is something that Gigi and I have covered before, but it's always great to get new perspective on this. So, Gigi, why don't you lead us into this? Yeah. So, again, I hate this term, but there's a popular term called the mind-muscle connection, which I think typically... Uh, 
people assume that when you're doing an exercise, you're thinking about your body and the sensations you're getting from your body. So me as a trainer, if I'm having someone do a bicep curl, I could certainly give them cueing to say, all right, now really squeeze that bicep. Um, or I could do the opposite where I could give them an external cue, which I could just give them a point in space and say, okay, bring that dumbbell to this point in space. And so I'm not giving them any sort of cueing to think about their own internal sensations. And so, you know, the four of us that are in this field know quite well about the abundance of literature about um, external cueing. But again, going back to my social media, when I see in the lay population, it's all internal cue. Um, you know, that the, the, I would say the consumer that's reading, you know, typical fitness magazines and watching typical fitness um, content, you know, it's really very biased towards internal cueing. And so, Nick, um, before I ask you your thoughts on how you cue your athletes, you, I know, did a little bit of work with Dr. Gabby Wolf's lab. And for anyone that doesn't know, even though I think we've mentioned her before in this podcast, that's really for the cutting edge of research for cueing in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, Gabby Wolf's lab at UNLV is the place to be. And so you actually got in the gates. So first, just tell us a little bit about your experience. And then, yeah, we'd love to hear about how you apply what you learn to your athletes. Yeah, so I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Wolf on my advisory committee for my dissertation. So I got to work with her over the period of a few years, developing some cues for rowing. Mm -hmm. And it was a great experience. And one of the, my biggest takeaways was how hard it is to develop the right external cues. And I think that's one of the reasons some of the external cueing hasn't made its way mm -hmm. into more common usage is that figuring out what those cues are, what the words are, and how to describe it is not as easy as it sounds. And so even working in a great environment, we struggled for a couple years to figure out the right cues. And you know, after we finished the research, we would even change them again now. We'd start using different cues. Can you give us an example? Yeah, if you could maybe give us a bit of a framework too. So rules can be thrown out. So I hate to use rules, but are there any sort of guidelines that the lay person or any of our listeners can sort of point to, to say, these are the things that I might consider when I'm trying to develop external cues? The most important one is to develop a cue where it's focused on the movement outcome goal, right? So it's thinking about what is the movement outcome goal and what is that? And then the second part is how distal from, my, from your body, right, from a specific muscle can you make it? So in golf, for example, right, you can think about the path of the club face, which is a good external focus, but actually the more effective external focus would be to think about where you want the flight of the ball at its apex after you've hit it off the tee. Thinking about that moment and having that moment in your brain actually gives you a more fluid motion that is more likely to result in a better outcome. So thinking about the outcome goals there is really helpful. And then making sure that you don't relate it to an internal part of my body. I want to, I'm going to hit the apex of this as long as I keep my shoulder down. Like that can be one of the things that ends up getting in the way of that fluid motion. So Nick, how would you cue that? So if you wanted, if you decided that the apex of the ball was the cue to have in mind, how would you personally cue that? Oh, I mean, you want to keep it very simple and you would want to say, right, you know, as you drive, think about where you want the flight of the ball to be at its apex. So would you actually like point to like a, a point in the sky and be like, just think about there? Sure. Mm -hmm. Something that's really external. And that's a pretty extreme example. I am, I think, you know, some of the other ones that I have seen used in weightlifting is press your hands through the bar. So as you're sitting here to do a chest press, the chest come, you know, the bar comes down. And then rather than thinking about your chest activating, you literally think about, okay, I'm going to press my hands through the bar. And you're trying to come up with things that push it, push or set yourself up to have movement that will achieve the outcome goal. But you're really thinking about something else that's externally related, but connected. Mm -hmm. And Greg, how would you apply that to your world of Pilates and dance and yeah, so it's interesting. Gabby Wolf and Rebecca Luthway, um, who created Optimal um, Theory Together, are the keynote speakers at the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science this year. 
Um, and there is a dancer, um, dance educator, um, Claire Gus West, um, who's really been translating a lot of Gabby's work into dancers specifically. Uh, because dance, again, right, is different where the movement is the, the goal. So getting it outside of, of, their, of the body. But dancers um, often also are able to like use motor imagery, getting them to think about what they want to move like or thinking about that end effect almost as an external cue. Um, so we're kind of bypassing that and trying to incorporate more external cues. Because one of the things I think is that like oftentimes, you know, Nick, you might be able to speak a little bit better on this in a second, but the dichotomy of like external and internal and whether something is like completely external or completely internal. And in the dance world, like I don't know it would be very difficult to cue an entire dance class externally the mm -hmm. entire the mm -hmm. entire time without using any body parts. Um, I don't know that it's entirely impossible, but kind of knowing that this work ends up on a dichotomy and like when as I as a dance educator can actually incorporate a lot more of these external cues as opposed to these internal cues and kind of try to steer my spectrum of cues more towards the external range. You know, I, I would think with, if you're learning a whole dance recital, is that, is that? Piece, uh, yeah. A piece, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that would be very amenable, first of all, to part learning, right? Because you're gonna learn elements of that piece. You're not gonna just continue to do the entire thing together until you've completed it. We'll work on specific elements of it. And my sense of it is maybe when you're working in parts, you have a great opportunity to introduce external cueing. Whereas when you're starting to put those parts into a more elaborate and complex piece, there may be other things that are required in order to put those pieces together. Maybe I'm just speculating yeah. here. I mean, I think it one depends on, you know, the core, the choreographer too, but like the other thing that is here is um, the performance aspect of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And like the, the person aspect, because you want to make that interesting. So they can't just have like a blank look on their face. So oftentimes a lot of these motor images or, or cues can kind of, um, help to get at that like one of the things um i danced with the anna Sokolo dance company for um for several years as well and i never got to work with anna herself um because i joined the company after she passed but in thinking about the dances and thinking about performance right it was always like well where are you where's the sun where's the moon as you're doing this right it wasn't ever like lift your hand in this way but like lift your hand as if you were on this and like you know you're constantly thinking about everything else and not thinking about the movement which is another way that like dancers kind of get to this external realm that's interesting you know sometimes when i'm cueing someone to do let's say a box jump and the reason i bring up a box jump is how different is that from something like a jeté right so wow. where where someone's doing a leap or you know these are similar and my cueing for someone doing a box jump is focus on a point about a foot above the box and jump to that point in space, a foot above the box. And when people think of it in those terms and think of that external point in space, they don't have to worry about whether they're making it onto the box. They don't have to think about what muscles are contracting. They're going to try to apply enough force into the ground so that they accelerate to a higher point above the box and hopefully that gets them to their goal. So that's an example of something that I would use that might apply to dance as well as, you know, if you're looking at a, a posterior point, Nick, then maybe in rowing, focus on a point about a foot behind you and move your pelvis to that point. I don't know if that's an appropriate external cue for someone in a boat. I haven't tried that one yet, but now <laughs> I am going to. <laughs> so, yeah, anecdotally, I found that, again, it's not an either or answer. And, you know, I'm just trying to find whatever works. But I, I just want to tell a quick story that 
Um, I didn't know external cueing even existed prior to like studying motor learning. And I had this client that I would see for, I mean, I probably saw him for five years and I'd go to his apartment gym. And one thing we would do fairly often is a dumbbell chest press. And each time I would, I would give him the dumbbells. I would get behind him as he was doing the press. My hands were there giving him tactile cues. I was giving him verbal cues. And I just noticed like every week when I would give him the dumbbells, he would look at me as if he'd never seen these objects before. And it's that I had robbed him of all the problem solving because if he made an error, I was there to correct it. Like I did not let him do any problem solving on his own. And so that was too much feedback and cueing it in particular. But, you know, I found that it's not a hard line that I've definitely found, um, success with people using more of an external focus. I've found, I've found for some people, I just have to lean more towards internal. So for me, in my experience, it's sort of, you know, I just try to figure out whatever I have to do to help that person solve their own problems, right? Yeah, um, Gigi, I had the same exact thing with a Pilates <laughs> client. I had been working with her for like a year and every week I was like, grab the handles, which are the back, right? And she couldn't figure it out. But every week I would take it and I'd be like, here they are, right? And then one week I was like, no, just find them, figure them out. And then from that week on, she knew where the handles were like magic. And it was a motor learning moment for me. Cause I was like, I have robbed her of being able to solve this problem for herself because I gave her the answer every week. So complete same. <laughs> I, I think there's a philosophical issue for some fitness professionals thinking that part of their job is to behave somewhat like a concierge and right? mm -hmm. let you know guide people through the process. Um, so I think for some folks, doing it that way is part of the service that they're delivering to people. But when we really step back and ask ourselves, what are we doing? We're trying to empower people. We're trying to help people improve themselves. We're not doing the magic. It's people who are creating the magic for themselves. The less we do and the more we cue, I'm going to coin that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that, there's a t-shirt right there. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, I think the better off people will be. And we all sort of become enlightened in this process of, you know what, we're doing it the wrong way. We've been getting too involved. We've been taking too much control. We just need to use a more intelligent process and make it more creative and allow people through the queuing that we offer, allow them to solve those problems and become the flexible problem solvers that they need to be. Yeah. Um, I, that I think also happens right in the Pilates world where like we, it, Pilates and yoga, like we love to cue you and uh, internally the entire time without a break. And there's so much learning that happens in silence, you know, that like uh, we're like, you're actually allowing somebody to problem solve. And I think that one of the things is that, you know, as Pilates or fitness or yoga instructors, when we've started to teach, we want to impart all of this knowledge, right? Like I have all of this information, let me give it to you. But that's not how we learn best. We learn best by like errors, right? And mm -hmm. making mistakes and figuring it out. So like mm -hmm. it comes back to this, like how do we set up things to allow people to learn? Okay, so that leads us into the next topic of conversation, which is pedagogy and how we structure learning environments and how we train trainers to be good coaches. And we're gonna do that right after this short break. Okay, we are back and we have, again, a great conversation. We've talked about cueing and internal versus external and getting people self-actualized and empowering people. Now what we want to do is put a little structure and framework to that. And so we're going to be looking at some pedagogical approaches. And I'm going to let our guests talk a little bit about that. Nick, why don't you sort of take us through your thought process on pedagogy and how that works in your environment? So in our environment, because we're in a collegiate environment, the entire system of instruction is still built around the school year and a lot of the residual stresses that impact the athletes. Mm. And I think that's important to know when we're thinking about development or performance, when they are tired, when they are stressed, when it is midterms or exams, 
the structure of what you can achieve in a practice, whether it's a skill development practice, whether it's a workout, really changes. And so a big part of pedagogy for us is understanding where the athletes are in their lives, how what's happening with their academics, what is going on, how are they responding to training from the week before, even the day before, so that we can make sure that on a daily basis, we're dynamically adjusting as much as possible with our end goal still in sight to say, okay, this is what we can do today. And then we're going to move forward from there. I take my heart rate variability regularly. Do you take advantage of any modern tools to help inform your decision making? Yeah, so we you actually use a system that tracks everybody's workout. It tracks recovery. Athletes have different ways. We give them the flexibility to choose the whichever way they want to track that. And so athletes, some of them have a band like a whoop band that will take their heart rate variability every night. Other athletes capture that manually. Other athletes do it through a survey, like a rest cue, something else that gives them an idea of their recovery score. So we're looking at all of these, tracking every single workout. And we're not just tracking, okay, today we had two hours of steady state volume, right? It's a, what did we do in the warm up? What did we do in the cool down? What did we do for the preventative injury kind of maintenance and care? All of those things get used. We use technology to make sure we're actually logging those, recording them, and measuring the impact on the athlete's development and performance. You know, it, it's an interesting question because, and especially lately, I've had a lot of conversations about something like a Whoop or the Aura or, you know, these different types of devices, and we're, we're getting flooded with information. And I guess my question always is, so what? I mean... We have this information. We have a device that says, you didn't sleep well last night. Well, I know I didn't sleep well last night because I was up half the night. <laughs> I don't need some you know, technology to tell me that I was tossing and turning. So, okay, now what? And I'm, sometimes I think we get so uh, obsessed and dependent upon technology to tell us what's going on when a little common sense probably is going to be just as effective. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. And this is one of the reasons that the rescue, which is a recovery survey that athletes can take, and they don't even have to take it all the time. You can take it once a week, once every other week, and you can get a pretty good idea of what is going on. There's a lot of information just within one of these surveys. There's another one that I really like by Hooper and McKinnon. It's a seven question survey that athletes can take in the morning. And it really tells you about, are they overtraining or are they in a really good place? So you can get a lot of good information without getting into all the granular data. What the granular data can do though, is if you can collect it reliably over a period of time, it can tell you when am I trending in a certain direction and it can help you make changes and predict, hey, I'm going to burn out in two or three days. Let me back off now. And that can be a little bit harder to pick up with some of the more common sense things that we are looking at. I think those are really important. I think you have to use those. You need to have that information present when you're thinking about how you're developing your training and what's going on. But it's those you could be fine with just those. Some of the other granular stuff is just going to be a little bit better at predicting, but there's still a large amount of error. And that's one of the things that data science and physiologists are still catching up on. Yeah, I, you know, it's whether we're taking the information and then applying our own analytical methods to the data versus being completely reliant upon the device to diagnose and prescribe. And I think in your case, I would imagine in a competitive collegiate athletics environment, you're looking at multiple sources of data and then you're running statistical models on those data in order to better understand what's happening. And I'm sure, Greg, you're doing the same thing in your world. And that's how I do things in my world. I guess the reason that I'm bringing this up is because people become so dependent on the device to just tell them what's going on and give them the solution. And I do agree with you. I think there's just too much variability and error inherent in those things, you know, to put so much faith in them that way. I would say we, we even know that that is not going to lead to optimal performance. And we talked a little bit about, we were talking about cueing and feedback, but there are studies where if people are getting that feedback in front of them on a monitor, on a tablet that's monitoring their performance all the time, 
and you take it away, they really struggle to perform because they haven't learned the skill. And I think Greg, you were mentioning something about this with dancers and mirrors. I, I, I'd love uh -huh. to hear your take on that again. Uh, so this actually wasn't my my work. Um, this is uh, Elizabeth or Betsy Coker, um, who is another graduate of the That's right. uh, motor learning program at Columbia and is now a dance professor at NYU. Um, because dancers, you know, become highland reliant on mirrors for for feedback, right? Like it's a way for dancers to get that more external um, feedback for them. But the thing is that like you become highly reliant on this mirror. It's not the conditions that we're performing in. You're practicing with this mirror in front of you, then you learn how to like pick up these cues and then suddenly you're on stage and you don't have that feedback, right? There's just the audience in front of you. And if you haven't learned the skill to pick up the, the feedback or to pick up the timing off of your other dancers in other ways, because you've been staring at the mirror the entire time. I think it's the same concept of cueing here is like, you can't become reliant on the feedback, right? You can't become reliant on the cueing. We have to know when to par these things down so that we can increase the problem solving. So let's, let's ask a slightly different question here because we all work in various parts of a whole industry, but you can look at collegiate athletics or professional dance or restorative dance. Uh, fitness, what's missing? So you guys went through an education program. You went through a higher education program as we all did. Looking at your industry, what's missing? What do you think is a necessary component that we should be adding to the body of knowledge in the areas in which we work? Greg, you were like eager to jump in on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, so the thing that I think is missing from, from dance education or dance Pilates is the notion of performance versus learning. Because what we're seeing in that moment of a dance class is not what they're actually learning. It's how they're performing, right? And I think that a lot of this overemphasis, right, on cueing and overemphasis on feedback is done from a place like a good hearted place. It's like, oh, I can get them to perform really, really well. But then you take all of that away and they can't replicate it because they haven't learned it. So I think that what's really missing is this concept of performance versus learning. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We talked in a previous episode in terms of cueing and feedback about knowledge of performance versus knowledge of results. And how do we cue that to our clients, right? When somebody's doing a movement, we typically talk about their performance, but we don't usually provide feedback about the result. Like, yeah, you did it. You achieved your goal. That was fantastic. Usually it's, well, yeah, but your back wasn't this way and your knee wasn't here. And that's the performance. But did they get the result? And, and I really like that you bring that up because I think that's a part of it. We need to get people to understand that there's a goal and are they learning in the context of achieving those goals? And then PJ Action, in our last episode, we also spoke a little bit about this idea of like cramming for a test and why you don't remember any of that stuff a month later. So that's the performance part. If I had a wedding next week, so Greg, you can come to my apartment, show me a dance routine, but unless I learn it, if you ask me to do that dance routine two months later, I'm not going to know one step of it because I performed it, but I didn't learn it. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really important concept to understand that you can practice something enough where you can perform it at one given point, but learning is all about retaining the skill and being able to perform it a period of time later. Yeah. And, you know, the thing too is that once you understand performance versus learning, right? Like a lot of these things that increase motor learning actually have a detrimental effects on performance in the interim, right, right? right? Not in the long run, but in the interim. So if you don't kind of understand that conceptual difference of performing or performance versus learning, it's kind of hard to buy into everything else that kind of comes after it. Right. So just to make that clear. So what you're saying is that when you're, giving cueing or feedback or trying to teach someone a skill initially because you're the way you're structuring the practice and the cueing and feedback, their performance might look worse than another group that might be doing the same thing repetitively over and over. But what you'll actually see over time is what the studies show us is that the group that does uh, practice the skill in varying conditions retains the skill much better. They actually learn it as opposed to just being able to perform it. 
Yep, exactly. So Nick, what's missing from your industry? Well, it's actually very similar. You know, one of the things that we are struggling with in rowing as a whole is what's the developmental path for getting involved in the sport? How are we teaching that experience so that it's fun and it's not overly competitive? There's a big tendency to jump straight into hyper performance, very competitive, uh, pushing at a young age when even, you know, for the sport, the bodies maybe aren't quite developed. And so we need to have a better, better idea of the developmental pathway and then how learning and performance interact with that. And I think one of the things that Greg mentioned that's really important is that we've seen within our own team was in 2018, we had a, an incredible performance year with an undefeated second boat, a varsity that won a national championship. The team won their first team national championship and team Ivy League championship. They had an incredible season. But when we went and raced in the fall, seven or eight months before that, I mean, we lost a lot. Like we went to one race and we came in 10th. It was not a great performance. That was because we were doing other things at that time to build skills, to build a foundation upon which we would ha you know, be able to perform later. And so it wasn't just that the performance could get worse, the performance got bad. It was <laughs> outright bad. It was not a good race, it was not a good performance, but there was no possible way the team could have performed well at that time with what we were doing. And so this idea of learning and performance it's not an abstract thing. We can see it in the results. And, and I know from what we were doing at the time that that's been a big impact on how we go forward now that we're not racing in the fall. We're just working on skill building because we want to be ready when it counts for our championships. So, Nick, I'm, that's fascinating to me. So when you're in the depths of, uh, you know, poor performance, how do you know whether you're seeing signs that you're trending in the right direction or you just lost the team and they're going south? Well, I think it has to be part of a planned approach. So when you're looking at your season, do you start at the end of whatever the out, and you know, we work in a season, it's not, um, so we have specific goals. I know that I need my team this year to be performing at its best in a five and a half to six minute period on June 5th at noon. Mm -hmm. Great. Now I'm working backwards from there all the way to what we were doing two or three weeks ago. Everything is connected through that process. And if you haven't taken the time to really work through all the things we've talked about, a number of the things you guys are talking about in different episodes, you're going to miss critical information and critical features that form this foundation of learning, skill development, and ultimately a really high-end top quality performance that is consistent. But is there, so, you know, in modern day sports, a raging conversation is the use of analytics. And to PJ's point, like, yeah, the, even if you're not a professional athlete, there are devices available where you can measure every bodily function you have, every movement you make. Yeah, Absolutely. I use a divining rod, by the way. <laughs> I walk around. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I use. That's my gut. And I have half the time, time it's right, by the way. So that says something about what I'm doing. <laughs> So anyway, um, that kind of leads us to our final segment here because I think we've, uh, we've covered some really interesting stuff. And what we like to do in our podcast is end with something called What Really Matters. And this is an opportunity for us to just sort of talk to the audience directly and you know, express your opinion. What matters the most to you? And so what? What does that mean for the listener? And, and how is it going to affect the way they think? What we try to do in, in our podcast series is get people to think differently, maybe to challenge their own assumptions, certainly to challenge conventions. And so what really matters is an opportunity for us to, uh, to do that. And so that's what we're going to do now. Gigi? Yeah. So, you know, in terms of this conversation, which is based on cueing and feedback, um, you know, this probably won't shock our listeners, but again, it's really about... Uh, problem solving, trying different things, and whether you're a coach or a trainer or you're just an exerciser yourself, um, you know, listening to these concepts, trying different things and finding something that works for you and being open to changing them over time. But again, the, the take home message to me through cueing and feedback is allowing problem solving to emerge, allowing yourself or allowing someone that you may be coaching 
to have a chance to make some errors and to Greg's earlier point in a safe way. So it doesn't mean that you're putting, you know, more load onto a barbell than you think they can handle or, or putting them, making them do endurance that they're not capable of, but in a safe way, allowing them to explore, make errors so they can acquire the skill. Nick, what really matters to you? I think I've got two things that really matter to me. The first one is the difference between a gold and silver medal is a choice. Mm -hmm. That is the most important thing, especially in an endurance race. You make a choice. There's very little difference, especially when you get to the high end levels of performance and you're at World Cups, World Championships in endurance sports. Physiologically, we're not measuring much difference between the gold and silver medalists. They are more or less identical athletes. Someone makes a choice to perform better. They make a choice to endure more. They make a choice to push more. It is a choice that is so hard to hear when you have a silver medal around your neck. It doesn't mean it wasn't a great performance. It means the difference between the two of you or the groups was a choice. And that is a measurable fact that has been analyzed and observed and it's present. We can't get away from it. Greg? Yeah, so I think that what really matters to me is that these are all tools, right? And that they're all at my my disposal at different times. Uh, Greg, or Gigi, you were saying, you know, if I'm trying to teach you a dance for your wedding, right? Like, I literally just want you to perform it well, right? Like if a dancer gets injured and another one is replacing them, like I just need them to get on stage and do it. So like I may use things that are more blocked practice or I may give them more feedback because they're literally about to go do it. And in that moment, that is the right decision, right? Because my mm -hmm. goal isn't necessarily about learning, but like if my goal is long-term like skill acquisition, that's when I'm gonna like incorporate a lot of these um, other tools that are at my disposal. Mm -hmm. Great points. TJ, take us home. So, you know, what really matters to me, and I've said this before, is that we empower our clients, our athletes, our patients. We empower them to become self-actualized. And everything that you folks have said is what runs through my mind in terms of what really matters. Let people experience it. Don't be afraid to fail. You know, I think some trainers, if they have a client on the floor and they're doing something wrong, they feel like they need to correct it immediately because people are watching, right? No one's stigmatized because someone's struggling to perform something. That's all part of the experience. And that experience is what helps us grow and be. So I think it's important that we all engage in a process that is not only growth for our clients, but in this case, it's also growth for ourselves. How do we become better? How do we learn to become better coaches, better instructors, better trainers, um, so that we can have a positive impact on the world around us? And that's what matters most to me. So with that, I want to thank our guests, uh, Nick Lee Parker and Greg Udon. Uh, it was such a pleasure to have you so insightful in um, your approach to what you do and how we shape it all and put it together. And we look forward to the next episode of Fitness for Consumption. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of Fitness for Consumption. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we love creating it for you. Now, we want to hear from you. So drop us a comment at our Instagram account, at Fitness for Consumption, and give us your take on what the hardest thing to do in sports is and why. And we'll pick an entry at random and bring someone on the show to talk about it. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to help us out by following us on our Instagram page at Fitness for Consumption, subscribing, rating, and reviewing our podcast on your preferred listening platform, and sharing the love by inviting some friends to listen to Fitness for Consumption. Thanks, everyone.